You're listening to the audio companion series for Digital Labor, The Coming Demise of the White Collar Worker, with author Thomas Young and Kieran Bajwa. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our podcast companion series for the book, Digital Labor. Um, I'm here with Tom Young today, the author of the book. Hey, Tom, welcome back to the studio. How are we doing, Karen? Doing great. So we're going to take a look at chapter three today, which is all about the rum jog maturity model. Right. And um, th- this is a really cool chapter. Um, so, Tom, can you talk to us about why you guys came up with the maturity model to begin with? Um, and then a little bit about what it is and uh, how people could use it. But I wanted to start with, so, because you talked about how earthquakes get measured, but there was no way to actually measure progress and change. Is that correct in terms of what the thinking was on developing the maturity model to begin with? Yeah, so I developed this when I was uh, consulting at uh, IPsoft. And we were doing, um, and they had really cutting edge automation uh, at the very front edge of the curve. And we would go out and do market briefings uh, to you know Wall Street and different banks and different insurance companies and, and, and things like that. And as we were doing that, it became clear to me that the term automation, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Everyone says, oh, it's been around for a long time. And that's true. Automation's been around with us for, for decades, if not longer. And so it was important for us to clear the or put in a framework in place that says automation's in, in, a, in a spectrum. And so we use a, a five-point maturity model that talks about how, the, depending on where you're at in that five-point spectrum, the impact to a, a, a different area of work or an ecosystem could be very different. So again, we used um, a lot of different metaphors to show how base automation, so like level labor, Level zero. So level zero is the first base, which is all labor. Right. right? And then we go into one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And because level one's been around for a long time. And if you say, oh, oh, we're going to introduce automation, like we've been doing that already. Right. Well, very few people are doing level three, four, and five. They might be doing one and two. But three, four, and five is where the real impact is. That's where you start to replace people with software. You don't replace people with software for the most part in levels one and two, except in very structured environments. Uh, yeah, and do you mind if we just touch on each yeah. of the levels briefly? So we have we have a chart in the book that lays it out, and it's a, it, it's a, it's a standard nonlinear curve. So it, as you move up in the, in the progression to go from level one to level two, the impact becomes sort of geometric or exponential, if you will. And so... The five levels are, uh, the first one is scripting, which is just uh, basically task automation. We talked about that in uh, the prior uh, uh, companion series. Orchestration, which is taking multiple scripts and stitching them together. And again, now we use a a couple metaphors to help people think through this. And so uh, in the chart, we, we add an A to the mix every time you move up from level one to level two, we add an A. So the first one is base automation. We're automating a task. The second one, we talk about orchestration, taking two things, three things, five things together, stitching together, orchestration. We add adaptability. So a, um, and again, in music, a single instrument playing is automation. An orchestra is multiple instruments together playing a symphony. So that's level two. Right. Level three, we add awareness to the to the mix, and level three is I, I, probably where the the not the cutting edge, but that's where the bulk of the cutting edge is today. There's there's people doing four and five today, but really where we're seeing the the beginning of impact of jobs is in level three. Mm-hmm. We add awareness, and that is the term autonomics. Autonomics is a term that IBM coined, and it has to do with more dynamic orchestration, uh, but it's this is where the Google car is, for example. So yeah. in transportation, base automation would be cruise control. Yep. Orchestration would be take front bumper radar plus cruise control. I have adaptive cruise, hence the term adaptability. And then level three is I had awareness. I put all these sensors, like the Google car has LiDAR and all these cameras, and I think it takes about a million data points a second. This is a driverless vehicle. It takes all that awareness about the, where the car is in traffic, lanes, is there pedestrians, et cetera, and is able to drive the car without a, a 
person. So that's level three. And again, that's where you start to see some tremendous things. Level four, we add a precognitive realm. Okay. And we add the term analytics. That's the fourth A. And that's where I take all this data that's sitting out there as a result of the first three, and I say, what can I do with it? Well, in many cases, you can predict the future based on the past. Mm. So I can make a predictive um, assessment yep. as to what's gonna happen. So think of like, for example, it's football season. I was just watching some football games yesterday. A quarterback sitting in the pocket ready to throw a pass. He is predicting who is gonna be open because of the lead time of throwing the pass. He has to throw the pass, calculate where he's gonna throw the pass based uh -huh. on the running of the receiver, the defense, et cetera. Well, that's the same way in a lot of different areas where we take a lot of data coming out of that. Now, they're using visual acuity and sound and sensory in the quarterback realm, but if I use in financial services, um, you know, high-frequency trading, which is taking all this automated information from equity trading, yep. and now I make a prediction of where the market's going to go, and I trade ahead of that. So high-frequency trading is a level four model. In transportation, that could be you know, I'm going to predict that the person crossing the street is going to be in my path and I'm going to stop before it becomes an issue. Uh, it, it can also take in traffic information and predict a reroute and do things like that. And you see some of that today in some of the, the traffic apps that you have today, they, they add a precognitive realm. And the last one is level five and it's cognitive. And this is the, the holy grail for a lot of people. This is where mm -hmm. IPsoft is spending a lot of their effort on uh, their platform, Amelia, but that ad, it's, we call it adding alive, where the the platform feels like it's alive. It's taking all these things together. Now, four is not better than five. Four is not better than three. They're foundational. They build on one another, okay. and they're very different technologies. So it's important for people to understand when we talk about automation, yep. where you sit. And I would say most firms sit in either one, two, a few, and three, and then others have point solutions for four and five that are very narrow. And what we talk about is the maturity model is understanding when this, when the, your progression of automation and technology hits across all these levels, you're gonna see a tremendous impact to jobs. Okay, very cool. And then I wanted to um, just get you to explain to our readers very briefly, um, you've got a term in here about the polar shift. Yeah. Or, or and you were saying before the inflection point. Yeah. So is three, a uh, three seems like the cool place to be. And if you can- Level three. <laughs> level yeah. three. And if you can um, start, if a company can start to feel that polar shift or inflection point happening for them, that has to be really exciting space. Yeah. So um, again, I don't want to go down to the, too much of a technical uh, issue, but it has, three is the pivot point for labor. Mm -hmm. So levels one and two of automation makes labor more productive for the most part. Right. Think of the car. Uh, cruise control and adaptive cruise, level one and level two, make the driver more efficient, but you haven't gotten rid of the driver. Yeah. The level three, the Google car, when I add awareness and all the sensors and I can replace the car, uh, I'm tra replace the driver and I have a driverless vehicle, that's the big impact. Mm. So the polar shift that we talk about has to do with how the ecosystem treats people in the, in the system relative to technology. So I have to run a business. And my, if my business is getting, you know, say the taxi business, yep. uh, I might want safety features in my car, I may want cruise control, adaptive cruise, all those things to make my taxi drivers more efficient. So I, I deploy technology to support my drivers. But as soon as the technology gets to the point where I can replace the drivers, I have a polar shift in my relationship. Now as the owner of the taxi business, I want, uh, I'm, I'm driving towards technology and the people that I have are supporting the technology, not the technology supporting the people. So it's the software engineers, the programmers, the maintenance people for that technology versus the drivers. Mm. And then we use the terms when we get to this polar shift of the architecture of the software actually moving from passive, like a tool, yep. to active, where it's actually making decisions. Mm -hmm. It's at this point of polar shift where we see the labor markets change tremendously. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're starting to see uh, a lack of, expert, of experts when we shift, 
which is, I think, at some level, slowing down the adoption levels in the market today, yep. but also creating a lot of uh, early winners in this shift because those people, if you're, if you happen to be an automation expert or something in one of the cutting areas like cybersecurity where you're dealing with the consequences of this, you're making a lot of money if you're a worker because you're in high demand. But if you happen to be uh, a taxi driver, I just use that example, you're probably struggling to make <laughs> ends meet. There's even articles that some of the Uber guys are making less than minimum wage. Yeah, I've been seeing reports around that as well. What's uh, going to happen and- when... They just get replaced with the driverless vehicle. Yeah. Uber will buy all the cars. And I think you talk about truck drivers yeah. a lot too facing this. Yeah. In this chapter, we talk about this. One of the, I, I think is a, maybe it was a prior chapter, we talked about the number one in yeah. terms of this number of people is in the transportation sector is truck driver or driver. Yeah. And a lot of them are going to get replaced. This is where Elon Musk talks a lot about the the impacts where we need to start thinking a little bit about regulation about what's going to happen and we we do have a lot of regulation in the transportation sector around driving uh, but that's it's going to happen those people are going to be replaced with software driving the vehicles themselves which has a tremendous amount of impact awesome well looking forward to continuing the conversation um, thanks very much for stopping by yep. And for those that haven't gotten the book already, uh, pick it up on Amazon, Digital Labor, The Coming Demise of the White Collar Worker, or visit digitallaborbook.com. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to listen to our next episode on Chapter 4, The Workforce Impact.